We're going to uh, be in 1 Peter chapter 4 this evening. We'll be picking up in verse 12. 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or a busybody in other man's matters. Yet if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. Not a strange thing. This portion of Scripture here from 1 Peter deals with a different type of suffering than we've mentioned before. The original recipients of this letter were heading into a very terrible time of persecution. You see, over in Rome, a madman had taken over as Caesar there. His name was Nero. And those Christians in Rome were already beginning to feel the persecution of his hand. And it's beginning to spread through the entire Roman Empire. Paul's intent here to the original readers was to warn those people. He's talking to believers. If you notice verse 12, beloved, he's talking to believers. And he's warning them that they are moving directly into the path of a, of a severe hur suffering hurricane. A hurricane of suffering. It's going to be a, a terrible thing that's going to come, on to them, come into them. The fact is, many of those early church saints would become martyrs. That, that first century Christian, so many faced death at the hands of, especially Nero here, being fed to the lions, burned alive, oh, so many things. Most likely, we were not going to face that type of persecution in our lifetime. We're probably not going to become martyrs, but we are going to suffer in this world. And Paul says, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials which try you, that is, which test you. I think most of us think when suffering comes on us, we have that tendency to say, wow, this is a strange thing that's happening to me, and nobody else has ever suffered like I'm suffering now. That's not true. At times, we tend to think our suffering is, is strange, it's unlike anything that's ever been experienced before by anyone else. We play the old woe is me game far too often. I want to tell you that I have no idea what your problem is, but I know that you are not experiencing something that's strange. Paul's telling us that. A multitude of people have gone through the same thing or worse, and you're never going to suffer more than anyone else has suffered. You know, a lot of times, we heard a lot. I know we have aches and pains, and it's a good example because we think, well, this pain is so bad, no one else is And then you see someone who's worse off. You might limp, have a bad leg, and you see somebody in a wheelchair. You don't ever think that you've suffered. And even if you have, think about the, the apostles, how much maybe they suffered for the Lord. They looked to Jesus and His suffering. So never think that you are being singled out or something strange when you do have some type of suffering in your life. Multitudes of other people have gone through the same thing or worse. You're never going to suffer more. Think back to the Apostle Paul. When he was called to be an apostle, the Lord said, 
I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. I can tell you from what I've read in the Bible concerning the Apostle Paul, he definitely went the limit in suffering, didn't he? Donnie's been talking about Paul in Sunday school and one of my favorite parts of Paul is he's sitting around the fire and he's teaching and the snake bites him and poisonous snake licks him off, keeps going. Suffering after suffering, but he trusts the Lord. So with that in mind, you need to realize that you're not going to, your, your suffering is not going to be the limit and you should never consider it a strange thing. No one, no Christian is exempt from this type of thinking because we fall into the, the error. We, we do have the error of thinking that way. We shouldn't do that. Think of, the, of a person and the doctor says, you have cancer. Our first thought would be, cancer is something that someone else gets, not me. Isn't that the way we think about it? That we, somebody else gets that, not me. Somebody else has this reaction, not me. You see, the fiery trial, which is to test you, should be understood in the present tense. If you go back and you look at the Greek here, it says the fiery trials which now are testing you. Right this minute. Those people were, in, were being tested. They are being tested strongly. You know, we don't understand completely what they went through because they're getting it from all sides. Especially if they were Jewish believers. They're being pressured by the Jewish leaders to give up Christianity. Now the Christians are being, being persecuted by Nero. They're getting pressured to say, I don't believe, I, I give up. Of course, they can't lose their salvation, but they can lose their witness, and that, that pressure is great. So the trial is going on right now as though some strange thing was happening unto you. It's happening now. Don't worry about it. Turn it over to the Lord. Those believers that Peter were writing to at that time were already in a fiery trial. They were right that moment being severely tested by suffering. Suffering was not something that was accidental. Suffering is the normal Christian experience. I've had people say, well, you're a Christian, everything's okay. Well, your eternity is okay, that's all fine. But Jesus didn't say that you were gonna have an easy time here. The world hated me, he said, it's gonna hate you. There's gonna be suffering involved. And that's what Peter is telling his original readers. Don't think it's strange because it's the normal experience for believers. Now for the believers, I cannot believe that I'm going through this. That's my normal experience. And it's still true for every believer today. When Peter says fiery trial, it's literally smelted in furnace. You know, David spoke of the fact that God's testing of him was like putting silver into a furnace to purify it. And we find this thought throughout all of Scripture. And now Peter mentions fiery trials, and he's mentioned it several times. Peter, like all the apostles, personally endured a great deal of suffering. And even everything that he had gone through to this point, he had something else to look forward to. He knows Jesus has told him. He's got a crucifixion waiting for him, yet future. Now with that thought, of suffering, Peter had endured. Listen to what he writes in verse 13. But rejoice. Wow. You're going to suffer. It's going to be a problem. But rejoice. That goes against natural thinking, doesn't it? I want you to ponder that. Why are we as Christians to rejoice in those trials? To the world, it doesn't make sense. You're supposed to whine and cry when the world says when things happen to you. The Bible says rejoice. The answer is because suffering prepares us for the coming of Christ. In as much as you rejoice because in as much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering that when his glory shall be revealed ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. 
when you are looking forward to something here, when God, and His glory is revealed, it's coming. He's talking about coming for the church. He's talking about the rapture. He says, rejoice because you're one day closer to being with the Lord. One day closer to Him coming. Be glad with exceeding joy. You know, there's a crown for expecting Jesus to come, looking for Him, expecting it. When His glory shall be revealed, ye shall be glad with exceeding joy. That's easier, isn't it? You think, well, oh, man, I can really have joy when I see the Lord come back for me, when I meet Him in the clouds. Paul says, Peter says, but rejoice when the suffering comes because you are partakers of Christ's suffering. Paul wrote over in Romans 8, 17, and if children, talking about believers, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Over and over, it talks about the suffering that a Christian is going to go through. I want to remind you once again, there are no shortcuts to the Christian life. The suffering, the testing that comes, builds up your faith, builds up your strength in the Lord. There's no easy way. There's no book you can read. There's no TV show you can watch. You just have to follow the Bible, endure the sufferings, the trials, the testings, and grow in the Lord. You know, the Christian life is a banquet because the Lord has invited you to sit as a believer to sit at the table of salvation. But it doesn't mean that being a Christian has, is like a picnic. A banquet, but not a picnic. Think about that for a moment. Where to? We are going to suffer for the Lord and with Him. We might not understand the reason for that suffering here and now, but we know that the reason for each testing one day when we stand before the Lord. We may not see it today. What we're going through might help someone else come to Jesus. It might lift someone else up in their Christian walk. But I'll tell you something, to my shame, I'll be completely embarrassed when I get to heaven to sit down with Paul and, and glory and be on the same level with him because he suffered so much for the cause of Christ, more than I ever will. Think about that. What these people have gone through before us, and we don't really know what suffering is. We're tested a little bit, but we're not suffering as they did. You know, there are many people who criticize Simon Peter because of his shortcomings that are recorded in Scripture. He denied Christ. Then people look at him and they say, well, he did this, he did that. What they need to do is quit pointing this finger and look back at these three and think of what you've done too. But when we all get to heaven, even those people who want to criticize him, you're going to have to look up to, to Peter. The Bible, which is God's holy word, makes it abundantly clear that suffering is a part of the Christian life. The important thing of suffering is that it develops us. You know, I've heard some of those quote-unquote wonderful TV fellows talk about how everything is supposed to be smooth and lovely, hunky-dory for the Christian marriage and in the Christian home. Well, as usual, you know, I'm not going to agree with them. It might be supposed to be, but you know it's not going to be. You can be sure that suffering and sorrow will come to a Christian home because Christians are not exempt from suffering. And you can't tell a Christian that he is going to be safe and secure and everything's going to be wonderful. I know, you know, 18 years ago, for example, I had the surgery for blood clot and I got deathly ill. I actually thought that I was going to die. I really did. And, but you know, that drew Dan and I together closer, I think, than anything in the previous years or since. Because that suffering, we, under, we, we learned that God's in control. And He works all things out for His good. And we realized that that helped us grow in our faith and our strength in Him. When suffering and trials come, and they will, trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. And Peter goes on to say, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, that's something you better get used to, happy are ye. 
For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he's glorified. You know, it's pretty strange language, I know, in, in the English and in the Greek. If you're reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. You ought to rejoice in that when you are attacked, when you are criticized, when people try to put you down because of your belief, because you're a Christian. Happy are you to stand firm in what they say against them. It's difficult. Yes, it's difficult. But Peter doesn't leave us hanging. He tells us why we are to be happy. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. When you walk the walk, talk the talk, you don't let those people who are attacking you get you down. You stand firm for God. You are glorifying the Lord. Even though they're attacking Him. When they attack a Christian, they're attacking God. If you stand firm, you bring glory to Him. And as strange as it seems to the world, suffering is a sign that you're a child of God. Wow. Wow. Think about that. Suffering is a sign. If you're getting by, okay, something might not. You better take a good look at your life. And the greatest proof that you're truly a child of God is that you can endure the suffering. If someone's being carried around in luxury with all kind of like silver spoon in their mouth or whatever, they must not be a child of God because it does usually God usually does the work that way. On their part, he is evil spoken of. But on your part, he's glorified. The born-again believer in Jesus Christ can glorify God no matter what the situation may be in the good times and especially when suffering comes. That's when you can glorify God the most. During a, the terrible earthquake in San Francisco back in 1906, a Christian lady came out of her house and she sang praises to God. Remember, the city was leveled. There were fires everywhere. Everyone was coming out of their homes and from, out from shelter. And some people were crying and some people were praying for the first time in their life. You know, God does some marvelous things to get people to humble themselves. And this Christian woman is singing praises to the Lord and someone asks her, what do you mean singing praises to God at a, a time like this when everything's been destroyed? Well, this is the greatest reply maybe I've ever heard. That little lady said, I thank God that I have a God who is strong enough to shake this little earth. Amen? How about that? She was looking beyond the suffering to the great God. She was looking beyond the devastation because she knew that that was going to bring a lot of people to their knees and a lot of people to the Savior. The fact of the matter is there are extremely few people who can praise God during the time of an earthquake or the time of a flood or the time of a hurricane. It takes a Christian of strong faith and maturity to look beyond the, the suffering to the power and purpose of God and give Him glory. It's a hard thing for us to do because, as I mentioned this morning, we can be self-centered. We look around at what's going on. Oh, this is terrible. What am I, what am I going to do? What you should be doing is, Lord, what do you want me to do? I know that you're in control. But let none of us suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other man's matters. Boy, I like this verse because so many people like to classify sins they have a little list in their mind and they have them numbered one to whatever. And they look and say, this sin is that bad, this sin is another. Mm. You know, they need to read that verse and pay close attention to the fact that Peter puts murder right in the same category with what? Gossiping and criticizing others. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we see there's no distinction between them at all. Sin is sin. That's basically what Paul said. Sin is sin. That's what Peter's saying. Sin is sin. Until you are perfect, until you never sin, then don't you judge anyone else. Which means what? We don't judge anybody. Because we're not perfect. You know, sin is sin 
and your gossiping is just as much a sin as murder. Ouch, that hurt, didn't it? Boy, I, oh, I saw a lot of toes curl up right there. Sin is sin, period. It's important for us to see that Paul said exactly the same thing. But you know, actually, Peter and Paul and James, they all agree on everything. The Bible never contradicts itself. Every one of those men were preaching the same gospel and they were that produces the same kind of life. Peter is saying, yes, suffering is part of the Christian life, but, and this is a huge but, not a single Christian should be suffering because of their own sins. And then he said, but not, don't you do these things. And God never tests with evil. Remember that. James makes that perfectly clear in his letter. Peter says, let none of you suffer as a murderer. Remember, he's talking to believers. He said, let no Christian suffer because he's a thief, an evildoer, a busybody, or another man's business. Don't do it. In short, a Christian is not to commit any of those sins we see that we think of as large or like murder or stealing or any other crime or even those little sins that we don't think we consider even sins at all most of the time. Notice I said what we consider not to be sins, small sins, but sin is sin. We have a tendency to say, I've heard a little white lie, color, that change it, no matter how small sin is sin. And I know most of us think that gossip is a small thing, but it's not. Gossip can cause pain and problems and Gossip can split a church family right down the middle. Gossip can be so bad that it can shut the doors of a church that will never be opened again. And sticking your nose in other people's business should not be the business of any Christian. Believers, sin is sin. Whether it's a large or small, we're to avoid them all. Peter said, That's, you don't, that doesn't glorify God. And we're not to be doing it. But he goes on, he makes a change here. Yet if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on, his, on this behalf. Unfortunately, there are a lot of Christians in prison and they're suffering the punishment for their crimes and that's rightly so, deservedly so. The problem is this, if a Christian is suffering because of his own sin, or in this case, his own crime, he cannot glorify the fact that he's in prison. He cannot glorify God for the fact that he has done something wrong himself. He's not suffering for the glory of God. That type of suffering is self-inflicted. And actually it does harm to the witness of that person and the cause of Christ rather than bringing glory to God. The believer can still glorify God even in, in that situation by his conduct and his witness in the midst of his punishment, and he can give, be a great impact on the lives of unbelievers around him. But our lives should be one of bringing honor and glory to God at all times and in all places. I want to read verse 17 once again. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. He's reminding us that every believer, every born again believer is going to appear at the judgment seat of Christ. Second Corinthians 5.10, Paul says, for we must all appear, Paul's writing to believers, before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. This is for the, what you've done for the Lord. We are going to stand there. Notice Paul says, we. As there's no doubt about the fact he's talking to Christians. And that thought in itself should make us better Christians. Thinking about what we should be doing for the Lord because judgment starts at the house of God first. He's talking about you and he's talking about me and he's talking about every born again believer in Jesus Christ. We're going to stand before him one day. 
that everyone may receive the things done in his body. In other words, those things that we did while we were living right here down on this earth for the Lord Jesus Christ or not for him. What did you do for Jesus? Was yours a powerful witness or a pitiful witness? According to the thing he hath done, whether it be good or bad, we're all going to stand there one day. Not, not in regard to our salvation. We know that too. We're saved. We're always saved. But whether you receive any crown or not, or any crowns, that's going to be determined there. So if this, if it first began at us, well, here's the question of the day for the world. What shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Jesus Christ paid the penalty for the sins of the world. He paid them in full. Nothing else to be done. Now just suppose for a moment that you're living a life that is not bringing glory to the Lord. I want you to honestly think about that. Contemplate on it and remember that one day you're going to be judged by the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Kind of makes you feel like trembling, doesn't it? When you think about what you've honestly done, and then you think about standing before the Lord and your life is laid out before you, what you could have done. So obviously, if God is going to judge His own, what's going to happen to the lost that would not or, or obey the gospel? Wouldn't accept it. They should realize that there's a judgment awaiting for them too, but it's a far worse judgment for them. It makes me shake from head to foot thinking about having, if I were lost, having to stand at the great white throne judgment. Because you see, you can defend yourself all you want to. You can hire the greatest lawyers that ever lived on the face of this earth. You're still guilty. And the result is a lake of fire forever. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Let's be honest here. We are believers, and you know what? We just barely made it. So what are you talking about, barely made it? The righteous are saved only by the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and their faith in Him. We did nothing on our own whatsoever. Nothing. On our own, we'd have been lost. It's only by the willing sacrifice of Jesus Christ, by the shedding of His innocent blood, by the God's grace and our belief in the gospel, that's the only way we ever got saved. We barely, yeah, you barely made it. Think about it. If you were, maybe you, you, you came to Jesus Christ on a Sunday. What if you would have died on Saturday? You barely made it. Think about that. There have been some terrible and difficult times in my past and I look back and realize that, boy, a lot of times I was on the wrong foot and it's nothing more than a, a great miracle that God ever saved me. Salvation is a mighty miracle. Think about that too. It's a mighty miracle. I want to tell you something. Even though I grew up in a Christian home, brought up in Sunday school and church, I still marvel at the fact that God saved a low-down sinner like me. I barely made it. And if I barely made it, so did you barely make it? It's an amazing thing. Now, John Wesley, most of you know the name. He said of himself that he was a brand plucked from the burning. And I think that statement is true for most, well, all of us really. We think about it. Most people don't realize that when John Wesley came to America, he wasn't saved. He was not a Christian. What? He came over as a missionary. True. He said this. It's a quote. I came to America to convert Indians, but who's going to convert John Wesley? His biographer wrote that at the governor's court in Georgia, he met one nobleman from Great Britain who was wealthy and powerful and he was sent there to govern that area. And he was a very wealthy man. 
and he had a beautiful young wife. And that young woman and John Wesley began to eye each other and evidently John Wesley fell in love with the governor's wife. He asked her to leave with him and go live among the Indians. You see, at that point, he was not a Christian and he was not a missionary. That woman sent him back to England. She said, John, I'll, it won't work. I love you and I'll always love you, but God has called you to do something for Him. I hope you heard that, Christians, because God has called you to do something for Him too. may not be a missionary to somewhere, but He's called you to do something. And that lady was evidently a Christian. And she sent him back to England. In his biography, he said three times he started up the gangplank and three times he started back down the gangplank and each time she waved him on. Go. Go. One night back in England, he was walking down uh, Andrew's Gate and he went upstairs to a meeting and a fellow was preaching on Galatians. He wrote his, journey late, uh, his journal later, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust Christ and Christ alone for my salvation. And there was given to me an assurance that He had forgiven me of my sins. So think about this. If the righteous scarcely be saved, if they are but brands plucked from the burning, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? That's what Peter asks. You see, even men that we look at as being strong Christians were barely saved. If you're not a Christian, and if a Christian like we are just barely made it, and made it only by the grace of God and trusting Jesus Christ, how do you think an unbeliever is going to make it? There's only one way of salvation. Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way. There are no shortcuts, no bypasses, no alternate routes. You must come to Jesus Christ because He's the only way of salvation. Without Jesus Christ, where will the, the unbeliever appear? Not in a pleasant place. Wherefore let them su that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-being and well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. The believer, believers who have really suffered are the ones who know what it is to commit themselves to God. Paul spoke of it, this in 2 Timothy 1-2. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I love that. I always remember Christians Regardless of the situation you face, God is able. Paul says, God is able. I ought to count that in Scripture. See how many times it's said, God is able. What was it that Paul committed unto God? Some people would say that it was the gospel he committed to Paul. I, I agree with that thought to a point, but I think it has a deeper meaning. I believe what, what Paul was saying is, I came to Christ and I simply committed everything to Him. Paul said, I made a deposit. He says, what things were gained to me, I counted as loss. And what was lost became gain to me in order that I might win Christ. He made a deposit. Now, he lists eight different things after that that he formerly believed in to save him before he came to Jesus Christ. Listen to the things Paul trusted in for salvation. Circumcised on the eighth day. Ritual. The stock of Israel, depending on his lineage. Of the tribe of Benjamin. A Hebrew of the Hebrews. Pride. Pride. As touching the law. A law keeper. A Pharisee. A leader. Concerning zeal persecuting the church, I was a judge. Touching righteousness which is of the law, blameless works. You see, 
That's what the unbeliever does today too. They trust in ritual and pride and law keeping and works and they're judges and they think they're leading people. Today and for the last 2,000 years, man has been doing the same things in an attempt to save themselves on their own terms. But you can't do it. Mankind attempts to work for their salvation by following ritual or trusting the fact that they were born into the right kind of family, seeing themselves better than others and always depending on good works to save them or being some sort of law keeper. I don't know why it is people say, I keep the law, I can be saved. The Bible says you can't do it. But let's see what Paul said following the things that he had once trusted for salvation. But what things were gained to me, I counted as loss for Christ. Yet doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but doom that I may win Christ. If we were to make that statement more understandable to us today, it would be like this. I took all of those things over to the dump and left them there. I placed no trust in the worthless things any longer because now I only trust Christ. Peter says, let them that suffer commit the keeping of their souls to Him. Remember I said Paul made a deposit? Every Christian makes a deposit. You know, I have to ask you now a question which is, has eternal consequences attached to your answer. Have you really trusted Jesus Christ? A lot of people today have safety deposit boxes where they take and they put their valuables. Maybe it's jewelry or papers. They do that so they can go to sleep at night and they don't have to worry about their valuable things. Those valuable things are locked up safe and secure. I laid down in bed last night and I went to sleep and I didn't worry about my soul. I don't think you did either. You know why? Because I went to sleep last night in peace. The peace comes from knowing Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. You know, long ago, well, it's been 62, almost 62 years now, I placed my soul in the safety deposit box of Jesus Christ. It's safe and secure. I never have to worry about it again. Paul did that. Peter did that. James and John and millions of others. It's a big safety deposit box. I placed my, my soul in Jesus' safety deposit box. Have you? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, this is a powerful portion of Scripture again that you have laid before us. And I thank you that you placed it here. And we know that you've told us that suffering is part of the Christian life. So be it. Because we know that you're greater than any suffering that we may go through. You're in control. And I pray tonight that everyone listening to this message has placed their soul in a safety deposit box of Jesus Christ. We can go to sleep at night knowing that if death comes, we're going to be with our Savior. And Father, we thank you that we barely made it, but we have made it for all eternity. And we need to realize that our witness and the way we glorify God has a great impact on the people who watch us. For if they don't accept the gospel, where will they appear? We know that it's a terrible future that lays out for them. I thank you, Father, for those who have been with us this evening. Thank you for a wonderful day that you've given us. As we leave tonight, I lift up our prayer list to you once again. I ask that you would be with us, to go with us, give us safety, and a wonderful week. Bring us back again at the next appointed time. Father, help us to leave tonight with joy in our hearts, a love for you that shows to all the world, and knowing that our soul is safe in the hands of our mighty God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.